Our next speaker is Ian Mays. Ian is an at-large Mars Society member from Minnesota, and he'll be talking about utopian colonies on Mars. Ian, take it away. Oh yeah, hello everyone. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'll start off by saying a bit about my background. Uh, my background, I don't have any background in any of the science, engineering, and tech stuff, which is quite common here in the Mars Society. My background actually is a uh, somewhat unique. It's a, I am interested in, in utopias and utopian societies and uh, thinking about how can human beings live in a way that's way more fulfilling, free, and just overall better than the world, the society that we have now. Uh, I've been interested in like essentially radical ideas and ideologies ever since I was a teenager. Uh, when I was a teenager, I discovered the philosophy of anarchism, also known as libertarian socialism. And uh, since getting into that as a teen, I've, it took me down a whole different rabbit hole, <laughs> which has resulted in decades now of me being involved in uh, political activism and organizing, as well as uh, living and uh, visiting, and in other ways being involved with different intentional communities across the United States. Uh, I initially, the first intentional community, which I'll go more into this later, about what they are. But the, the first one I lived in and worked at was a, a commune in Virginia called Twin Oaks Community. Uh, another more official, somewhat well-known one that I lived and worked at was, uh, the last one I lived at was uh, Camp Hill Sultane in Pennsylvania. And I've lived in a lot more smaller, more informal intentional communities than that, and been involved in different radical groups across the country and such. So that's something I've very much uh, been immersed in my entire adult life. And uh, so the reason I'm into this stuff is because I view these ideologies and practices and such, it's all aspiring to achieve a utopian society of some kind, some perfect or at least approaching perfect, <laughs> approaching healthy uh, society. And so these different ideas and visions about how you can have a utopian society, they usually come from either a religious or a spiritual background. You have some religious guru or text, cult, whatever, <laughs> that, uh, that pushes an idea of what the ideal world would look like. Or it's a social or political philosophy. And uh, as it's probably apparent already, my background and my interest is more along the lines of social political philosophies which point towards a utopia of some kind. Uh, but these two are not always separate. You sometimes have religious spiritual groups that also have their own unique particular social and political visions of how society should be arranged and why. Okay, so, so the reason why I got initially inspired to do this workshop here was hearing a uh, our, our grand leader, Robert Zubrin, on one of his interviews on a YouTube podcast, where he said, uh, I don't think that the possibilities of human social thought are exhausted by the present age. And also the Martian frontier will be a new place where new ideas can be put to the test. And that's, that's music to my ears. I, uh, I love the idea of having some kind of alternative idea about how human society and human relationships should be going to some place far away and testing it out, see if it works and see how you can improve upon these radical ideas to make them better. Because after all, a utopian endeavor is all about making things better. Uh, but so this whole how utopian society currently live in. And so that's what activism is basically about. That's what uh, protests and revolutions and all those kind of things. It's all about changing the world that we currently live in to hopefully create the new society. The other approach is what this talk is about more focused on, is about creating something new somewhere else. So that can be anything from an intentional community, uh, a colony, uh, whether it be in a remote part in the United States or on the ocean or even further away like Antarctica or Mars. So one thing that struck me, and I wrote this also in the description for this workshop, is uh, looking at historically about uh, when the Europeans discovered the, what they called the New World, uh, what we call North and South and Central America. Uh, Christopher Columbus, 
of course, discovering it in 1492. And then uh, just like 20 something years after that, the, the book Utopia by Thomas More was first published. And uh, that book, that's the, where the phrase, the word utopia was coined with that book. And the, the premise of it was a utopian society, fictional, of course, that uh, he imagined existing or that could exist in the new world, in the Americas. And so a uh, little over 100 years after that book was published, then uh, the uh, Puritan separatists went and colonized the Plymouth colony. They created the Plymouth colony. And uh, it was not inspired by that book. Uh, of course, they had their own beliefs. For them, it was, uh, comes from a more of a religious background. But they had their own beliefs and ideas about how human society would be more perfect, would be more fulfilling for everyone involved. And so they left the old world and went to what they called, at the time, the new world, and attempted to live out and create their utopia. And what strikes me when I think about this timeline, these three dates, is I could see a similar thing happening with Mars. Uh, instead of Christopher Columbus, we could say, whenever it is that the first human beings set foot on the planet Mars, maybe say 20 or something years after that, somebody can write a book or some other form of media that outlines and elaborates on what a new society on this new world could be like. And then probably, say about 100 years after that, some group that's not affiliated with a government or some big corporation, but just people with their own radical or alternative ideas of how society should be, could move to Mars and establish their own colony. So next slide. So utopian colony, I came across uh, this from a book by Robert Hine about the utopian colonies in California. So, and the definition, I really like this. Uh, so when I say utopian colony here, uh, I'm referring to the definition that he gives, which is a group of people who are attempting to establish a new social pattern based upon a vision of the ideal society and who have withdrawn themselves from the community at large to embody that vision in experimental form. Uh, so withdrawing yourself, you can call it dropping out. <laughs> you can call it uh, not working regular jobs, but living somewhere else to be with other like-minded people to create or aspire to create your new ideal, your new way of relating. So an intentional community, I've already thrown this word around. It's about time I give you guys a definition for it. So this comes from uh, the Foundation for Intentional Community. Uh, and the, the definition they give is a group of people who have chosen to live together or share their resources on the basis of common values. So uh, this is the Foundation for Intentional Community. It's kind of like a networking uh, organization that facilitates collaboration between people that are interested in intentional communities. And intentional communities can look like, you know, what a stereotypical hippie commune <laughs> where people buy a plot of land, uh, rural land, and they create an organic farm and they live together there. Twin Oaks, uh, which is what the picture that you see there in the slide, it's a picture aerial shot from Twin Oaks. Uh, that is an example. It's kind of like a flagship intentional community. A lot of people know about it. They, there's a lot of media that's been created about Twin Oaks. And I lived there myself for about two and a half years and I've visited many times since. Twin Oaks is about a uh, hundred people that live there. It's about 500 acres. It's in central Virginia, right smack in the middle of the state. It's been around since 1967. And uh, they have businesses that they had run on site and they make products and they sell to the outside world. And that right there kind of says something too, too as well, that the idea of dropping out and cutting off ties from the old society to go create your own new society somewhere else, it's never 100% that way. There's still always gonna be ties with the old world. And in the case of Twin Oaks community, well, one of their ties is uh, through their businesses that they manage and run on site and sell to customers from the outside world. <laughs> so the reasons for establishing an utopian colony on Mars, why would we want to do this? Well, two broad reasons would be one positive and one negative reason. Uh, the negative reason is that you want an extreme separation from the existing society. Uh, for whatever your beliefs be, uh, whether it be religious or political, 
you can come to a conclusion that the society that we exist in now is corrupting bad and we just need to get as far away from it as we possibly can so you just kind of cut yourself off from that and separate and so that's the negative reason right the positive reason to create a utopian colony is to have a fresh start on a new fresh untainted world and uh, and it's quite exciting to create something new in some place far far away a new society and a new world those would be the the two main reasons. Of course, everyone has their own reasons. <laughs> so I would say, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about the Puritan separatists coming to found Plymouth Colony, that is more actually what I would consider to be more what would be similar to what you would have with creating a utopian colony on Mars. In that the people that did that journey and made that commitment, it was pretty much a life commitment. Uh, they they went on a journey that took many months. They knew that they might not survive the journey. You know, it's kind of iffy. They weren't entirely sure what it would be like when they got there. It were going to, to create their new society. And the people that made that commitment to join, I mean, they were in it for life, you know, for better or for worse, however it would turn out. But I'd say for, for all of us here that we would actually find it more relatable to think about intentional communities. Uh, that's what I was talking about earlier with Twin Oaks and, and many others, where people that in the current world that we exist in now on earth that go join a commune or there's other forms of communities as well, like student co-ops or like that are students that live together, share expenses or other kind of housing cooperatives or co-housing. There's various degrees of separation from mainstream society they can have. You could, you know, there are in urban intentional communities that you could say are not as separated as going off in the woods, right? It's a whole spectrum there, right? But regardless of what form of intentional community we're talking about, that's more relatable and that's easier for you to actually just go off and join right now an intentional community as opposed to like the colony on Mars or like what they did back with the, the Puritans in Plymouth Colony. So there's a few different things that I have uh, for us to consider about establishing a utopian colony on Mars. So the first is uh, Dunbar's number. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's uh, the suggested cognitive limit of the, the number of relationships that we can keep in mind and keep track of, of all the different people in our lives, whether it be work or, or some other form of relationship, without with that's the the maximum number that we can have where you can keep track of those relationships and still have it be personal you still know each specific person things about them how they relate to all the other people the reason i think that this is important to keep in mind is if you go beyond dunbar's number things become impersonal they become bureaucratic they become alienated and I think for creating a new utopian society, it's important to keep it within the range that we know everybody who, everybody else who's in part of the community. We know them, we can relate to them, we know how they connect with everybody else. And so what I would suggest when you envision a new utopian colony on Mars is you keep that Dunbar's number in mind. And that number is, uh, it's said to be roughly around 150 people, more or less. So then uh, another thing important to keep in mind, as I think, is that all the information that's relevant and pertinent for the community should be transparent. It should be open to all the participants. You don't keep information secret in, with a certain elite group that you just share it among all the members and that you encourage and you, you set aside time and space for open discussion, for people to talk about all the various important matters that affect the community. Uh, everybody, what people are needing and what resources available, that, that along with many other things, is what the, part of the information that should be kept open and things that we should openly discuss in this community. Also, social experimentation. I view uh, these new utopian colonies as being wonderful places for experimenting with how you can have human relationships, how we can organize things together to just try out new ideas, like that Zubrin quote I had at the very beginning here, that we should factor this in, like, okay, when we design an utopian colony, what 
can we do that's different? What can we do that's new that could potentially result in there being more freedom, more fulfillment, more of a fulfilling, more of a fulfilling kind of community for everybody involved? But because we're talking about Mars here, we should always keep in mind the health and safety of everybody involved. So that would put a limit on the degree of experimentation you can do because you can keep in mind that Mars can kill you in any number of different ways. And so that should always be in the forefront as well. So yeah, like I said, uh, this is a very unique environment, very potentially dangerous environment, you know, being Mars. And so I would say because of that, uh, the necessities of life, what we need to simply be alive, she's always at the forefront and we and there's probably will be no way to really ignore that because <laughs> it's a life or death thing right but all the things that are required for living of course should also be public information everybody is aware but everybody's talking about it together uh also mental health uh there was actually a talk i was on right before this about mental health it's vitally important for a community and uh so much so that we can keep in mind that because of all the various life support systems for a colony, that all it takes is one crazy person to kill everybody. <laughs> so then what that means is every single member of the colony, you need to be keeping in mind, how is everybody doing? Is anybody really unwell? And what can you do to address that? And you, all, you keep in mind as well that conflicts between people and psychological psychological problems within a person, that's inevitable. It's going to happen one way or another. And so you need to account for that and you need to have systems and structures in place that can address conflicts when they occur and that can address psychological or emotional problems when they occur. So getting from here to there. Well, first off, uh, a massive organization that far surpasses anything that all the radicals <laughs> that exist have ever created would need it to be in place to help organize and get in place a utopian colony on Mars. Massive amounts of resources are required, but uh, that's, that's just, yeah, <laughs> that's just how it is. It would be a massive undertaking. Also, we would need strong abilities of everybody involved uh, uh, abilities to cooperate, abilities to collaborate together. Uh, I, like I've said, I've been around radical and activist circles for so long now that I see that a lot of times people have these high ideals for how a new society should be, but don't have any abilities for cooperating and collaborating with other people. This needs to be addressed and this needs to be accounted for and corrected, so to speak, in order to have your group organization be able to get to the point of establishing something like a colony on Mars. And uh, the first step is what we're doing right here, conversation. Before you can get to anything like an organization or assessing people's cooperative abilities, first you just need to get people that are interested together and talking with each other. So yeah, towards the end here, I wanna finish off with a quote by uh, my beloved Buckminster Fuller. Uh, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something. Build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And uh, this goes back to what I said in the beginning here of the two approaches to change the world. I mean, to, to create a new world, a new society. One is to change the world, the activist thing. You know, I have lots of experience with that. But personally, I'm not as excited as I am the other approach that Buckminster Fuller is talking about here, you create a new model, something that's better, something that makes the old model obsolete, and you try to bring that forward. One way to bring that forward is a utopian experimental colony on Mars. So yes, there's a, a bunch of different sources, uh, different things that you can investigate further that I just touched on just in the most brief of ways here in the talk that you can investigate yourself. One is the Foundation for Intentional Community, uh, ic.org. That is the go-to website for you to learn about intentional communities, uh, whether it be in the United States or other countries, that's the place to go. Global Eco Village Network, that's uh, intentional communities that are more ecologically conscious to create more sustainable, eco-friendly intentional communities. 
The Federation of Egalitarian Communities, that is an organization of which Twin Oaks Community is a part of. Uh, all the intentional committees there are income sharing. They're egalitarian, uh, meaning to, they strive to get rid of as much unnecessary hierarchy as possible and to have as much sharing and cooperation as possible. Communal Studies Association is uh, if you are more inclined towards an academic way of approaching intentional communities and stuff like that, Communal Studies Association is the organization for you. <laughs> then National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. That is an organization that is all about cataloging and implementing and analyzing various different approaches for how people can communicate and organize and facilitate groups together. And that is part of what I view as uh, some of the necessary social experiment experimentation that can take place in a utopian colony. And the Co-Intelligence Institute, that's uh, similar to the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. That is about how can we facilitate groups together to create the most intelligence, collective intelligence together that we can possibly do, as opposed to when groups are unconsciously <laughs> organized and fall into these really kind of uh, nasty patterns, you know, unhelpful, unhealthy patterns. Color Intelligence Institute is about how can we can create the most health and well-being together in our organization. So, okay, books. Uh, there's a few different books here. I'm not going to go into all these, uh, but one I would recommend that it, I view as the most pertinent here about creating utopian colonies on Mars is the three novels by Kim Stanley Robinson. It's uh, fiction, of course, but it's a, a brilliant, very moving illustration about how various, various uh, utopian colonies can be created and look like on the planet Mars. And yeah, that's all that I have here. Uh, if you, I'm definitely encourage continuing on this conversation. Uh, you can email me. Uh, you can also go to my blog. Uh, I've written a few different things about radical philosophy and interpersonal relationships and all these different things. And, uh, and I also, a few minutes ago, I created a new channel on the Mars Society Slack uh, for its hashtag utopian colonies. You can go there and we can talk more. And yeah, I'm gonna open it up now to whatever questions people have. Yeah, we have quite a few questions. There's been a lot of discussion in the chat. Um, so first question, do you believe it would be better to have multiple smaller colonies or one large colony for a utopia on Mars? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, multiple smaller colonies. And the reason why is, but, uh, goes back to what I was saying about Dunbar's number, uh, which, yeah, to remind you, that's around 150 people. Uh, I think it's important that everybody has a relationship, knows, understands everybody else that's a part of the community. And that, that helps with things such as conflict resolution and making decisions together collectively as a group. And so then once you go beyond that number of about 150 or so, then you can create the multiple colonies and then they can federate together. You know, create some kind of federation or network together. Similar to like what we have now with the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. That's multiple intentional communities that are working together and supporting each other. Okay, awesome. Next question. What is the difference between an intentional community and a cult? Was Jonestown an intentional community? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would say that cults can be well, I, cults are often intentional communities, but intentional communities are not cults. <laughs> so intentional communities where people live together, share resources to some degree. And so that you could do that and everything's totally egalitarian, or you could do that and you have your one big leader that you have to follow or else you die. <laughs> and that would be a cult, right? And so I, I actually view that uh, having a cult, that kind of unquestioning obedience or obey or else kind of thing, that is one in, big danger that you would have uh, creating an utopian colony on Mars. And the reason I say that is that I would be that the people that would make that kind of massive commitment to go pick up and move to another planet and create your whole new society there have a strong sense of ideological fervor and commitment, which, you know, can be great. You know, I've had a lot of that myself, right? But I think that the problem is 
when you close down your thinking, your critical thinking, and you have certain things totally off limits to like where you're gonna think, where you're gonna go. And especially when you have one leader person that's put up on the pedestal like that, that you cannot question. I think that's a very dangerous dynamic and should be, you should, we should be very mindful about how we construct the group and, and periodically have the group check in with each other and openly address how are we organizing together? How are we relating to each other? Are we favoring anybody? Are we leaving anybody out? Stuff like that. Do you think that binary concepts such as utopia and dystopia will be revised in the new Martian culture? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I hope so. I mean, the same thing happens here on Earth culture too. You know, it, things are never 100% one way or the other. And uh, things are always on a spectrum. You know, if, like if something's a utopia or not, it's, well, when you call it utopian, maybe it's more on the spectrum closer to the utopia. And likewise, the whole thing, idea of dropping out. Well, you can be more dropped out and more self-sufficient is the positive way to phrase it rather than less, but it's always a constant spectrum. What measures will be taken to ensure that a utopia will actually be just that? Are we going to hand select people that can be trusted with that kind of society? Yeah, well, I think uh, that all depends on what group you have and what your ideology is. And uh, based on that, you can have a membership process, a selection process. Uh, and if you were to create like some massive organization that can help support a future utopian colony on Mars, you could have some people that would have the role of supporting the whole organization and the whole endeavor, but they never leave her. And so, yeah, you can have all kinds of different roles and all kinds of different membership processes. I'm just going to, I'm going to try to ask for you, Josh. So you said to expand beyond 150, would it be better to have a representative from each group of 150, sort of like a republic? Or could each member vote on different or all subjects? I think he's kind of getting at when this column, when this utopia expands, does it turn into like a representative type of yeah. democracy or some type of similar political mechanism? Yeah, and that's, uh, and so what you said there, it reminds me of like the, uh, one of the concepts within anarchist philosophy is that of federalism. And so with that, you have your directly democratic group come to decisions. And then when they decide on matters that have to do with beyond just that one group, they send somebody who's like a delegate and they have a, a mandate of the things that they're supposed to agree upon or not. And if, and so the different delegates then meet with other delegates from the other groups and they come up with their decision. And hopefully they can make decisions based that fits within the mandates of all the different delegates. And if not, the delegates go back to the smaller groups and so forth. So basically that's a way to have your organization and collaboration between groups while still having it be a bottom up organizational structure. And that's different from a representative in that the delegate has a very specific, specific mandate of what they're allowed to agree upon or not. As opposed to a representative, they can disagree on whatever. <laughs> okay, um, I think this is gonna be the last one. We're kind of running out of time here. You have not, and this might, one might be kind of a long shot, Ian, so you've might, you've not addressed the majority of intentional communities, Christian religious communities. Have you thought about the rule of St. Benedict? Oh, I don't know what the rule of St. Yeah, Benedict Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> um, whoever asked that, would you like to unmute and kind of clarify what you meant? Yes, indeed. The rule of St. Benedict is the rule that almost all Christian monasteries um, have followed. It was, it was written in the 8th century by St. Benedict, Benedict. Most of it obviously has to do with, um, with worship because that's kind of what they were primarily into, but there is some of it that's kind of about how to run a community of people together. Anyway, thanks. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know that much about religious intentional communities, but I would say that uh, by far the most successful intentional communities throughout history and around the world have been religious based. You know, like, for example, here in Minnesota, where I live, there's a, a lot of different Hutterite intentional communities. 
and that is like one of the spin-offs from the Anabaptists. And they have a variety of different rural farms where they're kind of like the Amish and are somewhat related to the Amish, but uh, they don't get that much press. They don't get much PR. They're not seeking it out. They're just living their own life in their own little society in parallel to the society that we live in. So yeah, and that could very well be the case on Mars. You could have some kind of religion or heaven forbid cult <laughs> that would you know focus on Mars and they create their own little communities. And uh, I feel like more power to them, but that's not exactly the kind of thing I'm personally interested in. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ian. This was a great presentation. Uh, yeah, thanks right. very much. Yeah, thank you all for being here. And uh, again, yeah, if you all want to continue the conversation, I set up that Utopian Colonies channel on Slack. It looks like there's a few people in there already. So oh, cool. we'll, we'll see you all there. Thanks a lot, everyone. We'll see you in the next talk.